For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nathan. I have the privilege of serving as the Brighton Center CG leader. And tonight, I get the honor of preaching to you. And it's kind of I said last time, when I'm trying to figure out what to speak on, what topic to choose, I really just kind of dive into my own personal studies, the thing that I've been meditating and praying on, pull it out, repackage it, and just present it to you and hope that you are encouraged in the same way that I am encouraged. And I don't think it's coincidental that last month, David Skinner reminded us how important it is to praise God, to glorify Him for His attributes, for who He is. And this month, I would like to encourage you about the importance of thanksgiving, that we should thank God, that we should glorify Him for what He has done. You might ask yourself, why Thanksgiving? Why, why that particular topic? Well, let me tell you a little story. So early in May, we got a chance to go to Texas for a wedding. If you haven't been in Texas, Texas is an interesting place. So we got there, we flew in, rented a car, we drove to my friend's house, the groom, who was letting us stay with him. And the first thing that jumped out at me is that you drove up into a thing called a driveway, you parked the car, and then you just left it. There was no validation of parking, no meter to feed, no payment. No, you just could, anytime you wanted, there was a spot reserved for us. It was amazing. Then we got into the house. My friend had given us his master bedroom. Guys, this house had two bathrooms. Not one, but two. And there was one in the bedroom. This was so unfamiliar for me that I found myself going out of the bedroom, going down the hallway just to realize, oh yeah, my bathroom is back in the bedroom. I have to go back in there to use that one. During the course of the week, our clothes got soiled. We threw them into the washer, and that was it. You just hit start, and it goes. No coins, no card, no nothing. And the dryer was the exact same way. Like, so we were just doing clothes, at a whim, we can do a washer, we can wash our clothes whenever we wanted to. It was so fantastic. And everywhere we went, there was parking, there was climate control, so it was cool, it was nice and warm. When it was hot, it was nice and cool. Tremendous. And then we came back to Boston. And we flew in, we drove home. Someone had hit our car parked on the street. Didn't leave a note because they never leave a note. I went to the laundromat, did all of our laundry. I spent way too much money at the laundromat. And to top it off, been living in the same house for almost eight years now. I finally realized I could stand at one place in the bathroom and touch every single wall in the bathroom. And it's the only one we got. And so this series of events produced in me a little dissatisfaction, a little grumbling. My wife gently rebuked me and told me I was being grumpy. And so in turn, I turned to the Lord in prayer. I looked in scripture and I began meditating on, Lord, what do I need? I'm, I can't be grumpy. This is not the condition I'm supposed to be in. And the thing I kept coming back to is that I was lacking in thanksgiving was lacking in thanking God for what he had done. So, in turn, I want to take us to a psalm we all probably know. Psalm 100. So if you'd open up your Bibles with me as we read. We're looking at Psalm 100, starting in verse 1. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Would you pray with me over the preaching of God's holy word? Father, we know that you oppose the proud, but you give grace to the humble. And so, Lord, I just pray 
that we would come to you tonight and we would submit ourselves to your word, that we would acknowledge that in your word you have given us all we need to be equipped for the good works that you have called us to. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would take this moment, that you would use your word to stir up our love and our affection for you. Father, that you would guide the, my heart, my words, that you would be pleased in the meditation of all of our hearts before you. And Father, that in turn, you would be glorified in all things. So it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Now, if you were looking in your Bible, you might have noticed right off the bat, this is called a psalm of thanksgiving or a psalm for giving thanks. But what I think is even more interesting is if you look at the format of the psalm, it's broken down into a structure. There are four imperatives and then what I'm going to call a reminder and then three imperatives and then what I'm going to refer to as the keystone. More to come on all this, but the structure, four imperatives, reminder, three imperatives, a keystone. And since I am joining the No Point Sermon Club, we're just jumping right into the text and going at it. So let's begin in verse 1 with imperative number 1. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. So right here, the psalmist is giving us strong instruction. You shall make a joyful noise to the Lord. A joyful noise. What does he mean by that? Well, let's start with joyful. What does it mean to be full of joy? I love the way that John Calvin put it. He said that joy is a quiet gladness of the heart as one contemplates the goodness of God's saving grace in Christ Jesus. So we are supposed to have a condition in, in us that we contemplate the goodness of God that produces gladness that then explodes out of us in noise. Noise. This is a situation in which our ESV translation is a little weak. You ready, Owen? Here comes your time. So, when the Israelites marched around Jericho seven times, and they stopped, and they turned back to the city, what did they do? They yelled. The word that we use here for noise, exact same word. It means to shout with all that we have. And so we are called to shout joyfully to the Lord. And in case you think that somehow you're an exception, you get to opt out from this joyful shouting, just read the rest of the verse. It's, it's all the earth. No exceptions. We're all included. The psalmist is not pulling any punches. Imperative number two, we are to serve the Lord with gladness. And so once more, we have an action linked with an attitude. Here's how we're supposed to feel about what we're supposed to do. We are to serve the Lord with gladness. Word gladness there? Interchangeable for joy. This could be serve the Lord with joy. And right now, this already presents a challenge for me. Because when my heart is dissatisfied, when it's grumbling, I just want to go through the motions and get it done, and I'm not... Can't do that. Psalmist is telling me that's exactly what I can't do. I need to serve the Lord with gladness. The Scripture is demanding obedience from both of our hearts and our heads. Both of them. Not just one or the other. Imperative number three. We are to come into His presence with singing. Verse 1, make a joyful, loud noise, shout it out to the Lord. We are then to serve the Lord with gladness. This is all one train of thought, and now the psalmist clarifies what he started with. He clarifies that that noise, that shout that we're supposed to make, it's one of singing. We're supposed to sing loudly to the Lord. We come to the Lord with singing. This is why we sing on Sunday mornings. This is why we sing at prayer nights or whenever we kind of get together because God commands it of us. But here's the challenge for most of us. I don't want you to hear me singing loudly. It makes me very uncomfortable. Now, as a member of the media team here at Mosaic, I'm here to help. There's a reason that the sound is at like 85, 90 decibels any given Sunday because I don't want you to hear me. 
But here's the challenging part. The challenging part is that whether the music's loud or not, we are called to come and unashamedly sing loudly to the Lord. That's what the psalmist is instructing us to do. We're to make a joyful noise. We're to serve with joy. We're to sing into God's presence. And now for imperative number four, we are to know that the Lord, He is God. Closing out the last set of this first set of imperatives, excuse me, we have talked about actions, we have talked about attitudes, and now we are talking about a requirement of knowledge, of our intellectual capacities. We are to know the Lord, to know his attributes, to know his word, to know his good, pleasing, and perfect will. These are things we are being commanded to do. And what's fascinating is this is where our reminder comes into play. The psalmist tells us to know that the Lord, he is God. And then he almost makes an aside. He tells us that it is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Why is this stuck in there? Well, the psalmist has been rattling off all these imperatives, things that God is commanding us to do, and they're tied to this reminder to know that we belong to God. We're His. He has ownership over us. Therefore, He can tell us to do all these things. But here's another situation where our English kind of, it falls a little flat. As a matter of fact, you might even have a footnote in your Bible noting that part of the Hebrew doesn't make it into the English. The psalmist is rattling it all along. Know that he is the Lord. And then he tells us that it's he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And then here's the part that's missing. The psalmist gives us a negative. He says, we ourself are not. We ourself are not. And I just sat there for a while thinking like, okay, what? we ourselves are not. We, we got... Why is that there? And it finally dawned on me, the thing that I I took away from that passage was, it's not simply enough to say, yes, we belong to God. The psalmist is reminding us that he is God. Yahweh is Elohim, and we ain't. We're not. We are his sheep in his pasture, and his people is a reminder of God's authority and his ownership over us. That is why we ourselves are not God. Only He is. This is why God can give us all these imperatives in this passage is because He is authoritative over us. So thus far we've seen four imperatives and a reminder. Now for three imperatives and a keystone. Because I'm ADD, let's put two of them together. Imperatives five and six. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. The imagery here is really strong. So there is a wall, there is a court, and inside the court is the king, and there is a wall with a gate, and we are outside of the gate. We are excluded from the king, and in order to come in to the king, we must come with the condition of thanksgiving and praise. Thanksgiving and praise. And let's pause right here for a second. This is the first time in the psalm of thanksgiving that the psalmist has talked about thanksgiving. Why is it here? Well, I would submit to you, just as David last month had reminded us how important it is to praise God, likewise, hand in hand, it is equally important to thank Him. Why? Because this is a mark that we are born again, that we are Christians when we are, ex- we, when we are marked by thanksgiving and praise to God. And that's the imagery that the psalmist is using here, that you are outside, that you are away from God unless you come to him with a character of thanksgiving and praise. They go hand in hand with one another. And this is the byproduct of what happens when we look at God, when we see his goodness, his holiness, and how he has affected our lives. Our only right and true response is to praise him and to thank him. And the psalmist is telling us that that is required to even approach God. We must praise him and thank him. 
Once we are into the court of the king, we are then commanded to keep doing the same thing that got us through the door. Imperative number seven, give thanks to him, bless his name. We talked what it means to thank God, to glorify him for what he has done, but what does it mean to bless his name? I love the way that John Piper summarized it. He put it this way, to bless God means to recognize his great richness, strength, and gracious bounty, and to express our gratitude and delight in seeing and experiencing it. So we are to shout joyfully to the Lord, serve joyfully to the Lord, come into his presence with singing, know that he is God and we are not. We are to enter with thanksgiving and praise. And once we are there, we are to bless his name. We are to recognize his richness, his strength, his gracious bounty, and to rejoice in the fact that he has included us in what is his. This is how we are to bless his name, to rejoice in the fact that God has made us partakers in what belongs to him, in his presence. And so when you put these all together, all of these come together to this final verse to what I'm calling a keystone. Now, if you're not an engineering nerd like me, which I can't imagine most of you are, a keystone, what is that? Well, a keystone is the last stone that is put into an arch when it's constructed. So if you were to imagine this arch that's here above my head, and they were to stack rocks all the way up, and there's tremendous pressure pushing down, and the whole thing wants to fall in on itself, and you would get to the very top, and the last stone would be specifically cut and shaped to slide into that spot and hold all the tension in the arch. And if you were to pull that keystone out, the entire arch would collapse in on itself. But while it's there, the arch can support tremendous weight. It has incredible carrying capacity. I submit to you that this is what the final verse in the chapter is. Verse 5. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. As we look at this text, this is the first time that the psalmist has used a conjunction between the stanzas. The word for there, we could substitute that with because, since. So because of all the imperatives he's given us, we now have this statement. And what is that statement? That the Lord is good. And his love endures forever, that his faithfulness is to all generations. Why is this the keystone to the psalm of thanksgiving? Because to us, Christians, the antidote to our grumbling hearts, the solve to our restless souls, when we become dissatisfied and we are tempted to grumble, is to remember what the Lord has done to look at him and remember that he is good, he is loving, and he is faithful. And this is why the psalmist rests the entire chapter on this verse, because that is the weight and the power that it is when we cast our eyes upon what the Lord has accomplished. And the best part for us, this is 2022. The psalmist is writing this with just a small portion of the history of God in memory. And yet we sit here with the full canon of Scripture. We have seen the promises of God played out. We can start at the very beginning in the garden when God promises that through the offspring of a woman that he would crush the head of Satan, that he would destroy Satan's sin and death. We got to see God's faithfulness through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, Hezekiah, Josiah, all the way up to Jesus who is then born, not the son of Joseph, but the offspring of Mary, the offspring of a woman. He came and he lived a perfect sinless life that was required of us, died the sinner's death that we deserve, laid in a tomb for three days, and then rose again to life. And he did this to reconcile us to himself, making peace with the blood of his cross. And all of this stands as a testimony to the goodness of God, the love of God, and the faithfulness of God that goes on for all generations. This is the amazing testimony that we have. 
And so when we consider what God has done, our only right and true response should be to thank him. And that is why this is a psalm of thanksgiving. And so whether we live in Boston or we live in Texas, whether we have an easy life or a hard life, God is still good. He is still faithful. And so in the light of what God has done, church, let us always make a joyful noise. Let us serve him with gladness, come into his presence with singing, know that he is God and we are not. We are his, the sheep of his pasture. Let us come to him with thanksgiving and praise and let us bless his name because he is good. His love and his faithfulness endure forever. Let's pray. Father, we just rejoice that it was your will, your character, that you chose to intercede on our behalf, to see our rebellion and to withhold your righteous wrath from us, and instead you chose to send your son, to send him to a cross on our behalf, and you did so that you could be the just and the justifier. And Father, I just pray that we are a people that continuously rejoices in all that you have done, all that you have accomplished. Father, that your grace was poured out on us. In turn, Lord, I just pray that our response to you is praise, that it is thanksgiving for all that you have done, that in all circumstances we will rejoice because of your goodness, your faithfulness, and your love. And so, Lord, in all things, we thank you, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.